You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the traditional, ancestral, unceded, and occupied territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations here in Vancouver, Canada. And with me, of course, is Shagan. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone, and I'm Shagun Yedele, and I am joining you from Kelowna, which is in the traditional, unceded, and ancestral territories of the Silk Sokanagan Nation. We're so fortunate today to have a guest that um, maybe some of you will know, uh, maybe lots more of you will get to know through today's podcast, and i um, happy that uh, to introduce to you Michelle Lazarus. Michelle, do you want to say say anything further? Yes, thank you so much for the exciting invitation to be able to join this very esteemed group. I also wish to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulan Nation on whose land I'm sitting today and do much of my work, to be honest. Um, and I really would like to pay respects to the elders past and present. And these are definitely also unceded lands on which I currently reside. I um, am excited to be here, see what the discussion entails and yeah learning looking forward to learning from each of you as well wonderful michelle we're so happy to have you and for those who don't know where those lands are situated currently yes. those lands are called melbourne in australia so yes. um, just to give a little bit of geographic uh, colonial geographical context i guess in in this way Yes, so we're representing we're, the Southern Hemisphere today. <laughs> there you go. We're so excited to have you here because we can talk about every anatomist's secret passion, right? I always tell my students I'm a bit of a closeted embryologist, and then they <laughs> laugh and they they say, you're so out of the closet. Um, <laughs> we all know. So tell me, how did your passion for embryology start, like the development? Where yep. Where did it come from? <laughs> oh, the irony. <laughs> um, so I think my passion for embryology is also tied to advice I give to students, which is stop memorizing structures. Don't focus on identifying origins, insertions, names of structures, and then regurgitating for that in exam. You, you really need to understand the anatomical relationships, their functions, because that's what's clinically relevant. And when I was studying anatomy to get myself to move away from that memorization slash regurgitation cycle, I realized I had to understand how those structures got to where they got to and how they ended up developing into the functions that they support. And from that, I landed upon embryology, uh, which is everybody's most favorite topic to hate. And I think that uh, it really is powerful in the capacity to tell the story of anatomy. So to me, embryology isn't separable from anatomy. So that's how I got drawn to it. That's so fascinating because um, I can relate to embryology being this topic that everybody loves to hate just because <laughs> you know from my experience as well as someone who teaches the subject that everything is happening all at the same time or in yep. rapid succession and at such a minuscule microscopic level that to describe that you know it takes some skill so how have you over the years uh, developed the the, the terminology and the words and the and the imagery for describing uh, these processes that take place in embryology to your yeah. students. I have to first off credit my students who give very effective feedback on what is working and what isn't working and has led to that ability to tell that story. I think ultimately I view all education as 
adding to resources that learners can learn from. So I look to Google, I look to textbooks, I look to all the resources that, ed that students have right now of, at their fingertips, really. And I go, well, what can I add to this, right? Because I'm not my, I'm purposeless if all I'm doing is replicating what's in a textbook or what's on Google. So I think about, you know, what's the end point? Where are the gaps? And the gap really is, I think, for students, at least it was for me, and the feedback seems to be positive. The gap is, well, how did that developmental story lead to that adult structure at the end? And what happens in that story that leads to a clinical finding? And with that end point in mind, the, the details that are unnecessary to tell that story sort of fall away. Um, Cause I think that's where people get bogged down potentially is that my, you know, not focusing on the learner and my learner right now, the predominance of my learners are clinical medical students. And so they don't at this stage necessarily need to know all of the different factors that are causing the development. They need to know the big picture story of how the heart folds, um, what happens if we don't seal the heart properly into individual compartments. They don't necessarily need to know how cilia beat in one direction to allow that to occur. So I think, I think listening to my students, um, exploring that story and making sure that I'm focusing on that story and the end point has been valuable. Michelle, I love that you talk about the story there because it's almost like the origin story of the human yeah. is in yeah. development, especially when we look at how a lot of the steps, especially in early development in the embryonic phase are common among mammals. Um, and we can kind of look at our common ancestry there, right? Like where we, yeah. um, how we all develop uh, the body, uh, spine if you want the segmentation of the somites for me that's like i could watch a video of somite segmentation on a loop and i think <laughs> it's the most soothing thing ever right like just to watch it over and over again um yep. and those are of course when you look at those videos they're all in chick embryos and guess what it happens the same way in a human embryo at that exactly stage. um so tell me more about how the story of development helped you understand the human body um, with a new perspective. Yeah, I think um, I often refer to anatomy almost as the, the book, 100 Years of Solitude. So the 100 Years of Solitude is this really, really long, dense book, but it's a very good book. And um, at the beginning, if you open up the first two pages, you see a family tree that goes back like four or five generations with hundreds of names. And you can see that they're related somehow. But if you asked a student, hey, memorize this family tree, uh, it would be super duper challenging, I think, because there's no context to memorize it. And I feel like so many students enter anatomy thinking, I'm just going to memorize the ana anatomical tree, essentially. There's a bunch of structures. I see them in the upper limb. I see them in the lower limb. I see them in the thoracic cavity, et cetera. Whereas if we tell those structures as the 100 Years of Solitude story tells the story of these humans, this, this uh, family tree, you can actually retain that information better. So in the story, you start to hear these people who exist in this family tree, their story of how they related to each other, what happened through the generations, how they survived and they lived. And all of a sudden, you now know the names of everybody without memorizing those first three pages of the family tree. And the same, I think, is true of anatomy. Instead of going to the upper limb and seeing 100 muscles where we see, yes, they're related to the shoulder or the elbow or the wrist, uh, we can tell the story of how those structures develop. And by telling that story, we not only identify the names of those structures, but the innervations and the functions of those structures. And so in the upper limb example I just provided, for instance, um, we have with the upper limb, we have back muscles and then we have shoulder muscles. And the shoulder muscles are innervated by the anterior rami or the the nerves that go to the front of the body whereas the true back muscles are innervated by the 
posterior ramia, dorsal ramia, the nerves that go to the true back of the, of the body. And when we understand that development of the shoulder started on the front and many of those muscles migrate to the back, we now understand why mo many of the shoulder muscles are superficial to the true back muscles and are innervated by anterior rami. So I don't have to memorize that those muscles are innervated by brachial plexus, which are anterior rami. I can understand that through the storytelling of its development. So I think that's a classic example and really the motivation behind it. That's a wonderful story, Michelle. And I could <laughs> listen to you for hours <laughs> as you relate that story because it's so engaging and, and it makes sense. I think, you know, we're sort of nerding out here, but I, I like it a little bit in the sense that I hope the audience is appreciating this discussion in the sense that it's taking taking this the, the listeners on a journey how um we relate the embryology the origin the development to actually how those structures now look in the adult uh, or in the in the fully formed human being and and maybe i wanted to relate that to your educational journey to your mm. to your uh, um, own story in terms of how how your, your views have changed or not over mm. the over the years um because it's a complex thing and 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 to be able to to talk so comfortably um about these the, the knowledge that you're talking about i'm sure you didn't start out that way <laughs> no 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 or maybe you did maybe you absolutely you're the genius in the room and you absolutely did but you know can you tell us a little bit about your your educational journey and how um maybe an, an aha moment when suddenly those things came together mm. i think that i always loved science like absolutely fascinated by science have a strong desire to understand the world around me and when you love science you have two career paths, medicine or research. <laughs> it seems like you think you will have two career paths. Let me let's describe that. And I ended up choosing research and had the opportunity to teach when I was an undergrad and absolutely loved it. Um, and then did a PhD where I didn't get a chance to, to teach and eventually wanted to go back to it. The reason why I didn't choose medicine um, interestingly, was not only that I wanted to understand the world around me, but I also was terribly fearful of anatomy because my perception of anatomy was this unit. It was huge in medicine. And if I went into medicine, I'd have to do anatomy. And to me, I was one of those students who perceived it solely as memorization. And I knew that's not something I'm good at, nor, um, my fear was that I wouldn't remember it past that memorizing stage. And then I'd get into the clinic and not be able to treat my pain. It was like this catastrophic situation. So with that gap in my PhD, where I didn't get to teach, I started searching for postdocs where I would have the opportunity to teach. And it presented itself the scientist educator postdoc opportunity at Vanderbilt. And what was it? I could continue to do my science research, which I was still loving. I loved doing research and asking questions, but I also, um, had to, or got to, depending on your perception, uh, learn anatomy and teach anatomy in that postdoc. So here I was yet again, faced with literally a entire career potentially where I would be teaching and learning the discipline I was so fearful of many years ago. But then they had a little asterisk and I'm a practical person. I didn't grow up wealthy. Uh, oh, you can get a job pretty easily if you learn anatomy. And I'm like, okay, fine, we'll, we'll try it out. I went there um, and I loved it. I was like, this isn't what I thought it was. This is not um, just a list of structures that you uh, commit to memory and then spit out in a clinical exam. This is literally how the body fits together. And we all, we all walk around with this. I think, I think that's it is that when people hear, you know, anatomy, what happens, they, they tend to light up. Oh, can you tell me about it? Can I, everybody wants to understand themselves more. And I feel like I have the language and the knowledge of these structures to do that now. Um, and so I have a core belief that this shouldn't, this knowledge shouldn't just sit with us within academia or the clinicians. Like we are all better people when we have the language 
and the knowledge of ourselves, which includes anatomy. So I think that's where my journey has taken me. Oh, absolutely. That resonates, I think, with anyone who has taken an anatomy course, right? Because, and it's actually, it's one of the things I tell the students every year in that first anatomy lecture. I think that, that I said this line so many times when we learn about anatomy and about the human body, we learn about ourselves. Yes. Um, and it's it, it's such a profound thing, right? Like when you start doing the dissection and you realize that you have these exact muscles and, and all of that. Um, it's it's something quite transformative for, I think, our understanding of our of our humanity, of our um, sort of collective kinship, if you want, as humans, what that means. And for me, one of the things, you know, when we're looking at the world around us, um, is really how our human bodies have enabled us, for better or worse, to dominate this planet. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, the, the affordances that we have just through our anatomy um, are amazing, right? And I think being such um, like an older individual learning anatomy in my postdoc was really powerful juxtaposition for me because, you know, at that point I was going to doctors, my body might've had some meniscal tears, et cetera. Um, you know, so the conversations I was having with my doctors before I learned anatomy versus after I learned anatomy were so strikingly different. I could ask better questions. I could understand the information better because ultimately doctors learn the language of anatomy. And while they do their best to translate across the lay terminology and the anatomy, the anatomy language is very specific, right? So it can help actually bring clarity to the healthcare situation. So ultimately that's truly why I started the Ask Anatomist podcast and stuff like that, because I didn't, I thought we can all be better humans, better patients, better community members. If we understand a little bit more about our bodies. I agree. Absolutely. And maybe switching gears a little bit, or maybe extending mm. this conversation in terms of, um, you know how I'm reminded about um, one of um, my compatriot <laughs> authors, and if, um, Chimamanda uh, Diche, Ngozi Adiche, who says that, um, you know, the, the talks about the power of a single story, how yes. it is that you should not, uh, you know, depend on one point of view, you know, or rely or, or challenge your assumptions about the about the body. And and I like what you say about how your conversations changed, you know, before you learned anatomy. And then after yeah. you learned anatomy, you were you had the tools and the language to now discuss more intelligently. And I'm wondering more, you know, extending that conversation to say, even within anatomy, how for generations people have learned anatomy in a certain way using certain terms um, that have actually come with a color, come with a history, come with yeah. some connotations and with some prejudices, to be honest. Yeah. And so how, you know, maybe your work, you know, whether you've encountered those things and maybe, you know, so, uh, can you tell us of some of your, uh, maybe just your opinion about that, you know, in terms of how yes. anatomy needs to change or the language that we use to describe the human body needs to change with the different stories and the different perspectives that are that exist that is such a critical point because i think with society in general um how we understand ourselves within society is changing how we use language is changing. It's a constant change, right? Society and our concepts of what society represents, it changes. And this is a topic that's incredibly important to me. I am not an expert. And I would, again, I, I just, I, the theme of today I'm realizing is that how important the students are to the narrative of developing as an educator. So it was our students that highlighted to us, wow, you're spending a lot of time, for instance, on um, the male anatomy and you're comparing female anatomy to male anatomy. And it's almost like the female then be like the male becomes the standard and the female becomes the comparison. And I was like, 
at first, you know, as many of us do, we're like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, uh, and then I start digging deeper and I'm like, oh, maybe we are doing this, like the critical reflection. Okay, so now what do I do about it? Um, not being an expert in this area, I think was the first important piece of that. And the second piece was identifying somebody who I could partner with. So I am incredibly lucky um, to have been able to partner with a variety of people. Um, and uh, I was just going to get, well, I might get it in a minute, um, a textbook that I have of theirs. So I partnered with a clinician, a health professional, Aziel Adnan Sanchez, who wrote a um, series of poems actually about uh, visual interpretations and understanding of the different forms of the human body, essentially. Um, they treat patients in a variety of bodily forms and conceptualizations around gender and is really just a general practice clinician who helped me um, understand the space a little bit more. And what we started doing was reflecting on this terminology, for instance, the uh, fact that we say the female pelvis, when, when do we ever say the female heart or the female limb? Like, that's weird. Why are we gendering structures? They're just structures. And ultimately, um, by making them just structures, we leave room to treat all our patients. So I think that was one of the first steps we made was really critically reflecting on the language we use and whether we are creating unnecessary barriers to learning and also to um, creating an inclusive environment that's really true to the anatomy. So tied to that is the use of eponyms, which is the use of, you know, uh, people's names to name structures. And when you think of that initial degendering approach where we're trying to improve learning and inclusivity, Eponyms are the opposite of that, right? Because you're just having some random person's name that has nothing to do with the structure, identifying that structure. So I think we've really pulled eponyms away in the in the lab. And um, if we if we use them at all, it's the second term in that um, we use the anatomical term because it in, it describes the structure, um, and again removes the history tied to that eponymous name. I think it's um there was a comedian. Oh, what's her name? Uh, she's Australian. I just forgot her name. Uh, uh, it'll Hannah. come to me. Hannah Gatsby. Yes. Hannah Gatsby, who said, um, uh, we're using all of these male terms to define typical female anatomy. So it's Her just, segment on the pouch uh, of Douglas is it's is, fantastic. Is yes. It's um, fantastic. Yeah. So, so we've just worked on removing those as well, but I think the challenge is getting the clinic and the, um, the structural system around the clinic to also adhere to that. Yeah, sorry, Claudia. It's a long road ahead, I think, to change yep. the clinical approach. But I think little by little, we'll get there as the world is changing. I think one of the things that resonated with me as you were just talking is um, that we are telling stories, yep. right? And that we are telling other people's stories as well. And so the question really is, who has been writing the story of the human body over the past centuries, right? Um, if we go, who has been writing the story of the human body over the past millennia? It's all humans, right? The first cave paintings were of hands. Uh, people commemorated their body on the walls. And it was fascinating for me to learn that most of the hands on the cave painting walls are left hands as people trace them with their right hand to put them oh, on yeah. the wall. And, um, and so there's been this fascination with with our bodies and kind of leaving a trace of our bodies for future generations. So we've all humans, we've all been doing this. However, when we look at anatomy, the way it is taught in the year 2020 in the Western world, it's a very Eurocentric and white approach, right? And it doesn't reflect who we are as a society, doesn't reflect our students, doesn't reflect us. Um, and yet we find ourselves retelling the same stories, even if they're not our stories. 
right? Um, I, your story of how you start with uh, sort of the male phenotype and then describe as the female phenotype as um, almost a variation of the male, yeah. I think very typical. And it goes to that male storyteller who, of course, would start from their own body <laughs> and putting that above all else. Um, and I think we do this over and over again. So I guess my question is, who tells the stories and whose stories are we retelling when it I think that, yeah, body? as you were talking, I was thinking that too. I was like, when we tell the stories and I think that's the issue, we haven't been telling the stories, right? Um, I think when I look at the, we just did a review. And even if you look at, for instance, uh, I hate to call out a textbook because it's probably repeated across all the textbooks, but I'm going to do it anyway. Clinically oriented anatomy, when they compare across um, ethnicities and race, first of all, they don't define what they mean across ethnicity and race, which is a contentious uh, word socially constructed in and of itself, meaning it means different things to different people. They list it in the racial hierarchy which reimposes. So they'll say the white male variation, then the white female variation, then the um, person of color variation. And they do that in male, female again. So they're actually unintentionally, I would propose reinforcing the social hierarchy that exists. So when we say who is telling the story, I feel like we are telling our story of a westernized culture. I mean, that's the reality that this is so we can get into ideas of cultural hegemony, et cetera, but it's so embedded in our society that it's hard to untell. When you look at who writes the anatomy textbooks, it's mostly North America. So when I don't understand, you know, if you're from a um, anywhere in Asia, why why don't why isn't there there used to be textbooks for, that were um, Chinese textbooks or Japanese textbooks, and something happened that resulted in a Westernized view of that and actually a very U.S. centric view or a North American view. So the indigenous peoples and knowledges here is very different than those of North America. And to assume that representation in that context of anatomy is representation globally, I think is also um, inappropriate, I guess I would say. So I'd be interested to see the field not move towards one inclusive approach, but a diversity and even in the inclusion. So I think we are telling the story that is inculcated into the society we grew up in. And I'm so excited to see what the story will be as our generation and future generations get to retell that story as we slowly remove or at least explore through critical reflection which parts are truly our story or which parts are coerced to for us to tell <laughs> or historical yeah thank you thanks so much michelle uh that resonates with me and in a previous podcast i remember discussing how growing up in in Nigeria where I grew up yeah. how that um our culture and our language ha has different names for different parts of the yes. body and different stories how my father would <laughs> sit my sister and I and tell us stories you know uh, the African stories about um about just the village and the village uh elder yes. or the village town crier or something and, and, and inter, interspersed in all of those stories are some critical details or proverbs or wise sayings that use anatomical parts in, in very interesting ways and and you now know i want to hear a story <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and you know that's so uh for me you know and then it, yeah, how, how over the years I've, I've actually suppressed those things because mm. i don't use them every mm. day <laughs> and uh, which is a shame um and and um i'm on a quest to uh, i remember uh, my grand uncle has written a book uh just about just a local book about my particular uh you know heritage so uh, that's gonna be a starting point for me sorry i'm oh, using, good <laughs> i'm using this platform to say that but it's I... just kind of a personal story that i'm going to start there and then try to revive some of these stories and, and make sure that 
um, you know, my kids and, and their kids all learn about those stories because they're so important. They are so important. And even hearing you talk, I think about the clinical cases that are used in textbooks and they're very, again, centered on a very narrow view. Like the clinical experiences in Fiji, for instance, is going to be different than um, we're going to see in the USA versus in India. You're going to have a different prevalence of different. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's super exciting. And then also, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, we're even redefining what is evidence. We often use throw this term around in anatomy. Oh, there's evidence based that this is the function. What do we consider evidence as valid evidence? And that is pretty diverse. It's not just the Western conceptualization of evidence. Um, so yeah, it's an exciting time. Oh, I'm super excited about your book. <laughs> it's, um, I was just thinking about as you both were talking how, um, different cultures interpret the body in a different way. And I remember reading this and I'm not going to be able to piece it together precisely, but <laughs> even within Europe, different um, cultures interpret the body differently. So in Germany, yes. when you're really upset and you're kind of like, it really touched you in a profound way, in an upsetting way, you say that really went on to my kidneys, right? <laughs> and so, I don't know, kidneys, sure. Um, in France, when you're not feeling well, it's like, I think I've got something with my liver. And it's like, really? Your liver? I don't know how my liver is doing today, but apparently, you know, so we we interpret our own bodies uh, in a yes. certain way, right? Like even within a relatively homogenous culture, like the European culture, you'll still have these pockets of understanding that are quite different that, you know, will um, come out in idioms and such that, I mean, I still love this whole thing. This really affected my kidneys. <laughs> like, and that is my favorite, actually. I am now going to be using that regularly. <laughs> But I even, as you were talking, Claudia, I, it also um, another conversation we're having related to this is in these textbooks and these representations, they show what norm is and anything outside of that is considered a pathology. So somebody who may be a different weight than what's represented typically or um, have um, able-bodied versus somebody who needs uh, some support. We come at basically clinical medicine in the in these um Western views of medicine in a biomedical deficit model instead of a strength model. And all of that is how we perceive the body um, and how we understand the structure. So instead, and when we're seeing variation in the anatomy lab, is it really a deficit or just simply a variation that brings us, you know, and, and students always go, the, the first question when we see is variation, oh, oh, what's the problem? What would have happened to that? Instead of maybe what's their superpower? What did they gain from this? Or, you know, it's a very fascinating discussion to consider that the way we discuss and portray the human body changes the way we perceive its capacity to be the human body. Absolutely. I'll always remember this one student that we had in class who uh, summarized the anatomical view on or representation of the body as white CrossFit man. And I'm like, oh my God, that is so precise. That's... And if, if you compare every body to white CrossFit man, <laughs> sorry, we're never going to measure up, right? <laughs> if that's the ideal. That is so true. Exactly. <laughs> that is so true. As somebody who is not very athletic, athletic <laughs> I would not measure up at all. Um, so that's that's really wonderful. And these are really great conversations. And I'm sure they will spur uh, other conversations as our, our listeners take these um, words and these uh, conversation into their own experiences. And maybe to... Um, kind of come back home in a in a in a in a kind of so to speak in a matter of speaking Michelle to begin to ask you do you have a favorite body part oh yeah that's a good question um I think my favorite body parts would definitely be viscera. I like the variation. So we were just talking about variation and to me musculoskeletal anatomy is pretty I don't know, straightforward. I, I'm not excited by it. 
<laughs> I, I feel like you could learn it from a picture. Whereas I'm, I'm actually just in week 10 of um, our semester. I'm with our first years. We're just entering the thoracic cage and exploring heart anatomy. And so I would say that my answer to the question is heart uh, because it literally is an adult structure. Oh, I'm getting lots of thumbs up. So maybe I've said the right thing. I'm getting to the heart of the matter. <laughs> anyway, so oh, sorry. I think the heart is is perfect. And we're at the same part in our curriculum right now that we and Jagan just did the lecture on the heart. And I love how he's slipping more and more embryology into this first lecture. Yeah. <laughs> it's so wonderful. I, exactly. I think getting to the heart of the matter, I think literally the heart itself is a structure that is fully 100% embryology like you can't if you understand the story of heart development every structure all its vascular supply its innervation the reason why it's innervated by nerves from the cervical the neck region um, it's all clear so to me the answer would be the heart and plus it's the first time the students are seeing so they've had musculoskeletal anatomy boring just kidding just kidding um but we get into the thorax and there is a variation in every single donor that we have and they're like blown their minds are blown that we can be that different and still be typical if that makes sense so i think i'm gonna go with the heart and say visceral anatomy over musculoskeletal that already answers my next question. Your least favorite body part is obviously yes. within the musculoskeletal system, but I'm going to pin you down oh. and ask you to tell me exactly which part of the musculoskeletal system you have, okay. the, like you really dislike the most. I'm going to go with the foot. I'm going to definitely go with the foot. Um, okay. I find it um, unnecessarily challenging. <laughs> and, um, I think if you really love physics and maths, it's this brilliant, like intersection of everything critical and complex. Um, but for me, yeah, it's just a thing that holds you upright and could go wrong pretty easily. So <laughs> Whoa. got some laughs on that one. Weigh you a little yes. bit the importance yeah. of the foot for human evolution yeah. and upright gait and how it's this really clever adaptation of a limb that wasn't meant to function this way. Can I sway you a little bit? Yeah, then you'd have to get into a debate about bipedalism and how it led to the fact that we don't have like really good pelvic floors and all of these other things and we get lower back problems. So maybe we should have stayed on all fours. Maybe, but here we are. And the yeah. foot is part of that. I think I'm going, I'm going to call, call time on that. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can no. get into a very long debate about <laughs> And just um, say what it's been so wonderful having you, Michelle, um, discuss this wide ranging topics from your story and how you came into anatomy and embryology to the current teaching methods and, and the, the direction of teaching and the stories we tell in embryology and who's telling the stories. And I found this conversation very fascinating. Um, I know that you are on Twitter and, and Instagram, perhaps. Maybe you want to tell no. this our <laughs> audience <laughs> how they can uh, reach you uh, yep. on, on those platforms. Yep. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm on Twitter at Inside Out Anatomy without the E. So I N S I D O U T A N A. T-O-M-Y. Um, and at Ask Anatomist on Twitter as well. So those are two diverse viewpoints. If you want to reach me, the person that's the former, if you want to discuss all things anatomy, definitely tag Ask Anatomist. And I also want to highlight that our discussion about um, gender inclusion, diversity, et cetera, we've really taken that lens. We're finishing up, hopefully in the next century, um, a textbook on embryology. And we are really taking that lens in that textbook of um, trying to be diverse and inclusive and not assuming the type of person who is pregnant, et cetera. Um, we're defining terms really clearly in there. And I think that's really important that the resources that we use to teach anatomy keep up with the social changes that um, are occurring, so. Thank you so much, Michelle. It makes me so happy to see how the tide is changing in our discipline mm -hmm. and how we have such a beautiful plurality of voices and viewpoints entering the field and yeah. um, taking a foothold in education and in textbooks. Uh, I'm excited about your book, 
and I'm excited about where the field is going overall. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you for inviting me and for the discussion. I learned a lot. Right. And I'll, I'll finish on my final. Oh, I was just going to, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to finish on my final um, tagline that I use on all my lectures, which is relationships matter, at least the anatomical ones. Absolutely. Uh, and that's a great way to finish off this podcast of Body Banter. Join us again in a couple of weeks in our next episode. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.